Hello, everyone, and welcome to our hybrid event, Growing Up Jewish from the Holocaust in Hungary with Barnabas Valint. Um, so a quick hello to our virtual attendees and another hello to our in-person attendees. Um, I'm Maya Worrell, they, them pronouns, and I'm the program assistant for the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Um, I'll be starting the event with our land acknowledgement. To those in the Zoom room, um, please feel free to share where you're coming from in the chat. We'd love to hear it. Um, so the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research acknowledges our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva people and their neighbors from north to south, the Shumash, Tataviam, Katanamuk, Serrano, uh, Kuia, Payom Kuicham, uh, Hashimam, Kumiai, and Kocham whose ancestors ruled the region we now call Southern California for thousands of years. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claim to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and elders of these communities past and present who remain stewards, caretakers, and advocates of these lands, uh, river systems, and the water and islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. And you can find a more extensive land acknowledgement and history um, on the USC Department of History's website, and we'll put a link in the chat for folks. So I have the pleasure to, to introduce Wolf Gruner, the founding director for the USC Dornsife Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Welcome uh, everybody and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our speaker, Barnabas Balint, who is uh, the Breslauer, Rutman and Anderson uh, Research Fellow uh, of this academic year. But first, let me say uh, a few words about the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Uh, since its founding in 19, uh, 2014, uh, we concentrated on efforts developing innovative approaches um, of interdisciplinary research uh, regarding three distinct areas, resistance to genocide, um, violence, emotion, and behavioral change, and dig digital genocide studies. The center organizes a lively uh, program of academic events as this one, uh, but also um, frequent international conferences. And uh, here I wanna just uh, say that in the fall, we will have a big international conference on mass violence and its impact on indigenous uh, communities in uh, the Americas and the Pacific region. Um, part of our program uh, uh, is the fellowship uh, um, uh, section. And here, one of the uh, endowed fellowships, uh, which we can bestow, uh, is the uh, Breslauer, Rotman and Anderson Research Fellowship. It is the result of a generous gift by Gerald Breslauer, Mickey Rotman, Tammy Anderson, and Sharon de Greif. This fellowship enables an advanced standing PhD candidate to spend up to a month um, in residence at our center here at USC um, every year to do dissertation research focused on testimonies from the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive and other USC um, research resources on uh, the Holocaust and other genocides. Uh, let me introduce our uh, current fellow, uh, Barnabas uh, Balint. He is a PhD candidate in history at Magdalen College at the University of Oxford with a specific interest in the history of the Holocaust and its impact on society. He earned his uh, master's in modern European history at the same college and uh, his bachelor with honors uh, in history at the University of Exeter, uh, where he also received uh, the John Henderson Prize. He does uh, multilingual research in Eng English, French, and Hungarian, which combines the history of the childhood, gender, and identity to explore Jewish youth responses to the persecution during the Second World War. Uh, for his young uh, career, he has already accomplished and has written and published and presented at international conferences on aspects, on various aspects of the Holocaust across Europe. He is a co-convener and co-editor of Rallying uh, Europe, Intersectional Approaches to Youth in the Mid-20th Century, an international workshop, which will, as a result, also feature a special issue of the European Review of History, published by the universities of Vienna and Oxford. 
which will supposedly come out in two years. Um, he already published an article in the Journal of Holocaust Research last year um, titled Coming of Age During the Holocaust, the Adult Roles and Responsibilities of Young Hungarian Jews. He also published on the topic of uh, the Women's International Zionist Organization in the Journal of Oxford University History. He is currently a postgraduate representative for the British Association of Holocaust Studies, and this already kind of shows his uh, public hist uh, historian side. He has written blog posts about digital humanity methods for Holocaust research and also about prisoner registration cards from the Arlesen archives among other topics. In addition to his research and uh, his outreach, he also ded dedicates his time to Holocaust education and commemoration, including acting as a Holocaust Educational Trust Regional Ambassador, serving as a board member for the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust Youth Program, uh, and uh, leading the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust workshops um, uh, and the or organizing the award-winning Holocaust Memorial Day conferences in the UK at the Universities of Exeter and Oxford. And he won the 2016 United Kingdom Parliament Speaker School, School Council Award and the University of Exeter Student Project Award in 2018 for this kind of public uh, commemoration efforts. And um, Without further ado, I want to welcome, give uh, Barnabas Balint a warm hand, and we are uh, looking forward to his talk, Growing Up Jewish During the Holocaust in Hungary. Thank you, Wolf, for that warm welcome. Um, I'd forgotten a lot of what you mentioned um, there, so it's <laughs> nice to have a reminder. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and speaking uh, as part of the fellowship, research fellowship here at USC. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to the Center for Advanced Genocide Research, um, as well as to Rasa, Rutman and Addison um, donors uh, for this research fellowship that has really enabled me to uh, dive into the archives here and discover so much more uh, about the past um, than, I, than I would have been able to otherwise. I'd like to start today's lecture with two photos. On the left here, we have the 10 year old and or Brown with his parents in 1938. His father stands behind him in his military uniform, having just been mobilized for the war. And also behind him is his mother, uh, who was at that point uh, a teacher. Then to the right, we have the 35 year old now Alan Brown having anglicized his name. At his desk here, at USC, the University of Southern California, having just been given a tenure track position in the economics department here in 1963. Brown's journey from one picture to another intersects with many aspects of the Holocaust in Hungary and provides a good case study for how young Jews in Hungary have experienced their youth. Charting his life through the interview that he gave for the USC Shoah Foundation in 1996, we're able to discover much about Jewish family life during the war, Hungarian schooling, youth groups, responses to ghettoization, forced labor, and how young people formed their identities during this turbulent time. And so again, we have another set of pictures that Alan showed in his um, testimony. Because when Alan was 10 years old, his father was, um, his father reported to his position in the Hungarian army, wearing the uniform that we saw in the previous photo. He did this along with men up and down the country as Hungary mobilized her forces for the Second World War. Soon after, however, he was forced out of the army and into a forced labor battalion as Hungarian military and political leaders deems Jews and other national minorities politically unreliable to serve in the army. After two years of being in these battalions, doing what many survivors in their testimonies refer to as the dirty work of the Hungarian army, that of digging defenses, constructing uh, bases, airfields, that sort of thing, um, he returned home. And we see the photo next to him here of what he looked like when he returned. 
he returned because of illness. And as we see here, the physical toll that forced labor took on him is evident. In his testimony, Alan talks about how his father aged incredibly in the years that he was in forced labor. And we can see this, these two pictures are taken only two or three years apart, yet they look so much more. At the same time that his father was away, Alan started high school at the Mischkoltz um, Roman Catholic Father George Gymnasium. Here he appears on the annual yearbook of the school in 1939 to 1940, along with a report of the marks that he received in each subject. Now in Hungary, the marking system is the same now as it was back then, that you get marked on a scale of one to five for each subject, five being the top and one being the bottom. So we see here a, you know, a wide range of, of, of average marks, um, perhaps not ones that an economics professor would like me showing. <laughs> um, now, while he was at this school, uh, Alan suffered from anti-Semitic persecution, both from his teachers and from his classmates. Some of his teachers were key members of the local Hungarian um, administration. One of them was uh, the chair of a local sporting group. Uh, another was promoted um, to a higher position in the school, a promotion that actually had to go through one of the government ministries. And these are the people that often would mark him lower because he was Jewish or would say things to him that were explicitly anti-Semitic and often verging on harassment. Being a Roman Catholic school, religion was central to their being. Um, and the original religious affiliation of each student was listed on the school year, but can we see here the notation IZR next to his name to indicate that he was Jewish. In the year after his bar mitzvah, in 1942, Alan's parents decided to send him to a Jewish school. This was in another Hungarian city in Debrecen nearby. We can trace his movements to the Debrecen High School in their yearbook in 1942 to 43, where he's again, he again appears alongside his grades, much similar to the ones that he received the year, a few years before. The year he spent here was fundamentally different to that in Mishkots, where he came away, where he of course did not receive anti-Semitic treatment, it being a Jewish school. But if we think of the other elements of his schooling, the subjects, the, um, the, the, the sort of the structure, the teaching, a lot of that was very similar. Comparing, uh, comparing these yearbooks, we see the subjects, we also see the teachers, we see the history of the school, and a lot of that is incredibly similar to that of the Catholic school in Mishkots, and in fact, of uh, Protestant schools and non-religious schools throughout Hungary. But from the academic year 1943 onwards, Alan returns to Mishkots. We don't know why he was only in the Jewish school for one year. Uh, it may have been um, because of religious reasons. It may have been because of money. Um, we're, we're simply not sure. At some point, although his testimony is unclear about when exactly, he joined a Zionist youth movement where he discussed his Zionist identity with other people and talked about dreams for a Jewish homeland in Israel. Back in Mishkoltz, he returns to the Father George Gymnasium for one final year, because on the 19th of March, 1944, Germany occupied Hungary and German troops arrived in Mishkoltz. At that moment, Alan recalls his schooling came to an abrupt end, age 16. His father was called back to the forced labor and the rest of his family were forced into a ghetto in the Mishkots in April, 1944. When asked by his interviewer what his expectations of the ghetto were, Alan responded with a surprising but insightful statement. I don't remember exactly, but it was, given my age, an exciting experience. I'd just turned 16 and I was a member of the youth service. So we had special privileges. We could enter and exit the ghetto with our passes in order to run errands. Alan's reflection on his age here is significant. 
In many histories of the Holocaust, people talk of coming of age quickly and earlier, of assuming adult roles and losing a childhood. But in the direct opposite of this, Alan affirms his youth as having influenced how he experienced the Holocaust. Being a young age gave him agency and the opportunity to respond to what was happening in a specific youthful and also frankly teenage way. But his activities in the ghetto were not all exciting. Alan tells us about how he was forced to carry food into prisoners being tortured and sometimes had to carry their bodies dead out. He narrates a particular, particular experience that would shape him and his family's life. One of the doctors from the, ghetto, from the makeshift ghetto hospital had a sister who'd been arrested and taken to this prison. He asked Alan to take in a pill for her, which would make her appear as if she was dead. Alan was then able to carry her out as if she were dead and take her to the hospital, thus affecting her escape. In exchange, the doctor wrote an attestation that Alan's family needed to be in the hospital for convalescence. Being in hospital gave one better food and living conditions and was highly sought after in the ghetto. By securing this for his family, Alan performed a caring role that we could interpret as taking over from his absent father. Alan was proud of this achievement. He recalled how they were much more comfortable in the hospital than they were at home. They had decent food and so forth. But at this point, the pace of his interview slows down. Throughout the rest of his interview, Alan talks quickly and with purpose. But here he slows down, pausing within and between sentences that he struggles to form as he narrates what happened next. But when they were taken away, the hospital was the first to go to the gas chambers. So I guess I shortened their lives. Continuing after a four second pause to say, my grandparents wouldn't have lived, but I don't know. This heartbreaking story reflects the constant uncertainty and the insanity of the Holocaust, as Alan's expected good deed for his family backfires on him and them. In June 1944, the Mishkolts ghetto was liquidated. It's nearly 14,000 residents deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau on five transports. One week before this, Alan was summoned by the Hungarian military to be conscripted into the forced labor battalions. Aged only 16 at the time, he was well below the minimum age of 21. Himself confused, Alan had an almost comical interaction with the commissioning officer. In his testimony, he explains how when asked about his age, I said 16, and he, he the commissioning officer, dictated 18. I said 16, he said 18. And after a while, he just shouted at me and said, do I have to teach you how to lie? Lying about one's age is a key component of the age as a category of analysis during the Holocaust. It exposes how perpetrators viewed age as being linked to ideas of physical usefulness and fitness for work. And it reveals how Jews could leverage perceptions of age and of their own physical appearance to survive. At the same time that Alan was lying about his age, that was being made to lie about his age, a group of Hungarian women in Auschwitz were lying about their age, some of whom, some of them were lying about their age, and partially as a result were selected for a transport out of the camp to a forced labor camp named Allendorf. Comparing camp documents that we see on the right, a prisoner registration card and um, the camp, the, the list, the transport list, both from the Aholson archives, with the VHA testimony, one of which we see on the left, shows how people um, lied about their age. We see here 1926 for Valeria Holstein on the right, whereas her true date of birth revealed on the VHA is 1928. Lying about a, by lying about his age, 
and or avoided this. He was not sent to Auschwitz. Instead, he was sent to a forced labor battalion at the Czechoslovakian town of Jolšva. Miraculously, here, he met his father. Alan describes their reunion, and when he does so, he again slows his pace, saying, I went to the labor camp where my father was, and we met, and we were together. Alan's statements here, as well as the way that he says them, tells us about the importance that this reunion had for him. Alan also explains how there were three other pairs of fathers and sons in the labor camp. Forced labor in this way created new masculine communities. We know from Holocaust research on concentration camps that maintaining family bonds could be an important part of Jews' survival. The forced labor battalions provides a Hungarian specific example of this outside the confines of the camp and in a place where the perpetrators are almost exclusively Hungarian. As was common with these labor battalions, Alan and his father were transported across the country. And this map created using ArcGIS plots their trajectory whilst in forced labor across and in fact outside of at times Hungary. They were first sent to work at a sugar beet manufacturing place in Peel Monostor, which is this one at the bottom here, um, in modern day Croatia. They were then shipped up to Schopron uh, near the border of Austria. And there in December, 1944, they were handed over to the SS and stationed in a camp at Neuhaus in Austria. It was here that Alan received the help of Rosa, of a, of a local non-Jewish pharmacist named Rosa Schreiber, who would later be named Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem, the honor given to those non-Jewish people who risk their lives to save and provide aid for Jews. Rosa gave Alan much needed food and medicine for his father, who by this time had fallen very ill. Despite this help though, Alan's father died on the morning that the Red Army troops arrived and liberated their camp. At this point, Alan returned to Budapest, then to Mishkolz. In Budapest, he received aid from the American Joint Distribution Committee, one of the agencies that supported Jewish refugees, often in cooperation with local Zionist youth organizations. Finding nothing and no one surviving for him in Hungary. Alan joined, journeyed out of the country and through various DP camps across Europe before emigrating to Miami, where his father's brother had lived since 1920. In the States, he had an impressive career, marrying, gaining degrees, scholarships, and even fellowships. In 1963, he was awarded a tenure track position here at USC in the economics department. And he later moved up to Windsor, Ontario in Canada, where he lived until his death in 2010. Alan's history therefore reveals a lot about the history of the Holocaust. For this lecture, I'd like to focus on several key themes that have emerged from his story. First of all, the balance between assimilation and Jewish identity. This is a theme that monopolizes the history of Hungarian Jewry. As we see from Alan's story, Hungarian Jews were deeply assimilated into Hungarian society and culture. His father served proudly in the Hungarian army. He attended a Catholic school and the teaching content evident through identical yearbook structures was incredibly similar. At the same time, Jews faced harassment and anti-Semitism in almost all areas of life. Alan talks in his testimony of Jewish girls having their hair pulled in elementary school, a profound example of the young age at which Jewish children had to encounter and experience anti-Semitism. Reacting to this, Alan bemoaned his fellow, Jewish, uh, his fellow Jews for their apathy. Remembering a time in school when, other, when he and other Jews were attacked, Alan said, when somebody called them dirty Jew, 
they walked away. And I felt it was very cowardly and also very unfair on me because I had to do all my own fighting. Alan was not of the opinion that ignoring persecution would help. At school, he recalled, I had fist fights practically on the hour, every hour. We went from one class to another, and in between, somebody would attack me. I would back into a corner and fight against usually two or three at a time. Alan's experience of anti-Semitic harassment shows a shift in the balance between assimilation and anti-Semitism. This had an acute impact on Jewish youth, the majority of whom attended non-Jewish schools. The integration of Jews within non-Jewish schools reflects the extent to which the Jewish community believed itself to be assimilated. They believed that they were able to attend these schools with no problem. But at the same time, in the changing environment of the 1920s and 30s in, in, in Hungary, when anti-Semitism was on the rise, it also exposed Jewish youth to further attack. No longer viewed as Hungarian first and foremost, young Jews grew up in an environment fundamentally different to that of their parents. This generational gap is reflected often in the responses to persecution too. Alan, a young Zionist, is a good example of the type of person who opposed the traditional non-Zionist elder Jewish leadership that often refused to give up age-old understandings of Hungarian Jewish assimilation. More active and activistic opposition to persecution often came from the youth and was correlated with age and political leanings. This fundamental shift in the dynamics of the relationship between Jews and non-Jews in Hungary, and the way that it had played out across generational lines, also had a profound impact on Jewish families. We don't know what um, uh, Alan's father thought about his son's Zionist activities, but we can assume from his membership of the Hungarian army that he viewed himself as fundamentally Hungarian. In other VHA testimonies, we see many examples of children arguing with their parents over their responses to persecution and particularly their membership of Zionist groups. In fact, family is another main, research, main aim of my research and of Alan's life. His early separation from his father due to forced labor split the family. Moreover, the visible change in his father's appearance which we can see clearly from these pictures of him, mean that Alan's father's position in the family as a strong masculine head was undermined. Away from the family, he could no longer fulfill the traditional breadwinner role. As we saw, Alan somewhat stepped into this role when in the Mishkolt ghetto, but we cannot fully um, view this as a, as a replacement. So the dynamics of the family were therefore fundamentally changed, particularly when we consider wartime masculinities. Men's diminished position in forced labor meant that this was a time for many, uh, meant that this was the case for many families across Hungary as most Hungarian Jewish families lost a man to forced labor. Alan's reunion with his father in the forced labor battalion also further complicates how we perceive wartime masculinity and wartime family. His father was still not in a position to care for, look after, or protect his son. Indeed, instead, they both formed part of an enclosed and enforced masculine community of forced laborers. In this environment, we need to rethink how we approach the concept of masculinity and family relations. Alan's mention of other sons with their fathers shows how important family bonds remained in the forced labor battalions. Moreover, the small acts of care that were still possible attained a newfound significance. When they were in the SS camp in Neuhaus, Alan's father gave him some tobacco on his birthday. Alan didn't smoke but he could use the tobacco 
to barter for food. This act of fatherly love took place on Alan's birthday, the 20th of March, 1945. Just 12 days later, Alan buried his father, who died on the morning of April the 1st. The act of fatherly care juxtaposed with the 17 year old son burying his dead father shows the significance that Jews attributed to having a family member at their side during their ordeal. Importantly, the family bonds here are those of father and son, namely an intergenerational one. The very presence of the father thus acted as a constant reminder and signifier of Alan's youth. In an environment where the concept of youth loses much of its material background, not much of its material value, remembering as well that officially only those aged 21 and above are able to be in these battalions, the family units, the fact that the family unit can act as a reminder of youth is important within this environment. And persecution changed people's perceptions of age and what it meant. On the one hand, young people assumed roles traditionally the purview of adults, such as that of a labourer or of caring for another. But on the other, their young age cannot be completely ignored because it remained fundamentally relevant. From the youthful spirit with which Alan approached his life in the ghetto to his continued connection to his father, young people's own awareness of their position as being young is a crucial part of their identity. This comes into sharp focus in an anecdote that Alan tells us about a boy that he met in the labor camp in Shopram. I remember there was somebody there who talked to me that night and I, he sounded so old. And I said, how old are you? He said eight, he said 19. I thought he was joking. Next morning I saw him, he was dead. He sounded like a man too old for a labor camp. Alan's trouble constructing his sentences here, which we see in the, the broken speech, much like uh, in, in the broken speech, much like he had when he spoke about his family, remember? reveals the traumatic effect of this interaction, which stayed with him for decades after the war. His shock that the man was so young shows how forced labor changed people's physical appearance, detaching their outward appearance from their true age. Alan's comment that he looked too old for a labor camp is particularly shocking when we consider that actually age 19 he was too young. Because forced labor was both an age and a gendered phenomenon. And it's something whose characteristics changed significantly over time. It was first established in 1938 at the same time as national conscription. The forced labor battalions were first in their, in their first incarnation a section of the Hungarian army, differing only in their lack of weapons. Men who were deemed politically unreliable to serve with arms, Jews and members of other national minorities, served in these units, which were often attached to another military one. They wore a military uniform, they underwent military training, and they were sometimes even paid. The nature of these battalions changed fundamentally during the war, as we see from Alan's testimony. His father, who was sent home at the beginning uh, because of illness in those early years when the forced labor was still a purpose, the, the purpose of these battalions was still forced labor, was called back after the German occupation as it shifted towards a tool for persecution. At this point, the formal rules on age, that minimum age of 21, which was designed to ensure that those conscripted were fit and able to contribute for labor, were unofficially disbanded. As we see from Alan's conscription, aged 16, one still had to be old enough 
to be considered able, here the viewed as 18, hence the necessity uh, for him to lie. But the legal requirement of 21 is clearly out of the window. Allen's experience of forced labor also fundamentally differed to that of those in the earlier years. Allen had no training, no uniform, and certainly no pay. The conscription of people like Allen and the boy that he met in Shopron therefore show how age intersected with perceptions of ability and of fitness for labor. But they also show how anti-Semitism influenced people's perceptions of these. The combination of age and gender is important here. Upon entering these battalions, people like Alan were men. They were both adult and they were male. But just because they were viewed as such doesn't make them so. Young Jews experienced these environments as young people with all the challenges, both physical and mental that come with them. The social concept of being a man itself under extreme attack in the forced labor battalions is one that fails to adequately explain and describe and represent young people's experiences and positions within these battalions, but it was one that was applied to them nonetheless. So just as we needed to rethink masculinity for Alan's father, we also need to rethink it for him and the young people who were in the four slayer battalions, and we need to rethink it in conjunction with thinking about age and gender too. Because in fact, gender was another key theme to consider with Alan's experiences. As we've seen, gender was closely intertwined with age as categories that shape each other. In Alan's story, this is most easily seen through his part in the four slayer battalions. But in fact, these categories had shaped his life for years before, when he was at school. Schooling in Hungary was a profoundly gendered phenomenon. Both of the high schools that Alan attended were all male, and as were the majority of schools in Hungary. This table here shows the number of students broken down per year in the interwar period in the Hungarian, Jew Hungarian middle schools, um, Kuzepiskola being a, a literal translation for middle school. Um, and it shows it with regards to Jewish students, but then also um, across gender. Now, the table shows that the number of, um, sorry, these statistics show are, are striking in how they differ by gender. Although the number of girls attending school was always markedly lower than that of boys, the proportion of Jewish girls attending schools is significantly higher than the proportion of Jewish boys, almost double in some cases. This suggests a further intersection, one between age, gender and culture, with a potential stronger tendency uh, and inclination towards girls' education amongst Jewish families than non-Jewish ones. And these statistics also serve as a powerful reminder of Jews' place as minorities within their society and the position of people like Alan within their school communities, especially when faced with hostility, as we saw earlier. It's easy when thinking about this hostility to view Jewish schools as an oasis, a safe space where, which is completely separate from the rest of society um, and removed, from, Hungar removed from, from elsewhere to be safe for Hungarian Jewish youth. And to a certain extent, this is true. Jewish schools, as we saw with Alan, were a safe space free from anti-Semitism. But on a wider scale, gendered age and schooling experiences were strikingly similar between Jews and non-Jews. Jewish girls were a minority in the school system as with non-Jewish counterparts. Jewish and non-Jewish schools followed the same structure and, uh, and, and had a similar curriculum. These highlight the fact, that, that, sorry, these highlight the first theme that I brought up, that of this balance, this constant balance and this constant battle between assimilation 
and Jewish community. And this is a theme that actually is constant and cuts across the rest of the themes, the gender, the family, the age that I've spoken about. And so as a final example of this, I'd like to take a bit of time to look at the history of the Debrecen Jewish school that Alan attended. The school was attended in, so the school was established in 1921 as a response to the chaos of the attempted communist takeover of Hungary. Its founder was Albert Kardos, whose picture is behind me here. He was a deeply assimilated Hungarian Jew and his school's stated aim was to instill Jewish boys with a Hungarian national spirit in addition to religious education. His school taught a wide range of traditional subjects, including Hungarian, Latin, geography, sport, singing, and Hebrew. Kardos was a major figure in Debrecen, and in the 1920s, they even named a street after him, which remains in place today. A local dignitary in Debrecen gave a speech in which he hailed his strong Hungarianness, his instinctive sense of language, purity of language, and felt tendency towards Hungarianness. This was the school that Alan Brown attended, his safe haven from anti-Semitism, a place where guiding a place where the guiding ideology was supposedly that of the Hungarian national spirit. Because of this, the school, and indeed Alan's entire testimony and experiences, are good windows into the complexities of the Hungarian Jewish identity. Kardos himself died in 1945 in a concentration camp in Austria. Now this Jewish identity is one that changed in response to antisemitism, but which had different meanings for each member of Alan's family. Young boys like Alan experienced these changes differently to young girls, and further still to that of their Jewish parents or older relatives. This accentuated the impact of persecution on family units as different members of the family reacted in their own ways. In the history of the Holocaust, Persecution both divided and united families, often in tragic and heartbreaking ways. We saw this in the actions that Alan took to try and help his family, as well as in their ultimate separation. The deep trauma that this left in Alan was felt for decades. An insight that the Visual History Archive of the USC Shoah Foundation shows clearly through being able to see, the inter see, see how interviewees like Alan construct and deliver their memories. The constant unease and reworking of the balance between assimilation and Jewish identities thus wove itself through the themes of family, of age and of gender that made up Alan's life during the war. It's only by recognizing their interconnectivity and the ways that these elements shaped each other, that we can truly understand how young people, young Jews grew up during the Holocaust in Hungary. And so I'd like to close today by talking not about what happened to Alan, but about what he did with his life. He went on to have an impressive career as an economist, as an economist here in the States. Indeed, 26 of his publications are held here at the USC libraries. And he also went on to have a family of his own. Here we see his daughter, Fern, with her partner, Ginny. We see his son, Steve, with his own families, but with his own family, and his other son, Dennis, with his wife. These pictures and Alan's long life are a, test, are a powerful reminder of the individual and the human stories at the center of the Holocaust. They're a symbol of the ultimate failure of a genocide that sought to murder all the Jews of Europe. But they're also 
a tragic reminder of the lives that could have been, but never were. All the people who we've seen die throughout Alan's testimony, his extended family, his mother, his father, his schoolmates, the 19-year-old man in the bunk in Chopron, the people whose dead bodies he carried out from the Mishkolt ghetto, people whose names we shall never know, who, have been who were denied the opportunity of the life that Alan was so lucky to live. Thank you. I believe there is some time for questions. Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start. I had several ones, but I start with one. So first of all, thank you for uh, this uh, really interesting uh, life story, which kind of encapsulated so many themes uh, in terms of what this is doing. Uh, and some of them are really new and uh, interesting. So um, you told the story that he was with his father together in one of the camps. Yes. Uh, and you elaborated a little bit about this relationship. Um, can you uh, give us a little bit of insight um, how other relationships in this camp mm -hmm. evolved and why you focus on the family relationship, which was or what were the relationships really important for his survival in these camps? So relationships within these, these environments are incredibly powerful and there's something very important about the fact that these are groups of young men um, who are thrust together. Um, Alan was lucky enough to be able to remain with his father, but that was not the case for, for many um, Jewish young, young Jewish men who were conscripted. And in fact, in the testimony of uh, another survivor that I've been able to listen to whilst I'm here, um, the, the, the man was split off from his father. His father was sent to another camp. Um, and actually, when he left, his father blessed his son with a Jewish blessing and told him, to remain with another boy who was, um, who was in that camp, to never let them out of each other's sight. Um, now, interestingly, the survivor who gives this testimony in his VHA testimony talks about how after a, after a short while, he actually took, the, took a moment of chaos in the force battalion to escape from this unit. And he made his way by hitchhiking back to Budapest. When he got there, he was stopped by a, um, a roadblock and asked for papers, which he didn't have. And because of that, he was denied access into, um, into the city. He turned around, walked back, and actually returned to that labor battalion where he met up again with the boy that he'd been told under no circumstances to leave. Um, now, the two of them from that point did truly never let each other out of their sight. And they were sent from camp to camp right throughout Hungary and beyond. And they used that relationship as a way of maintaining some sort of, um, some sort of bonds, some sort of continuity uh, and sense of self. That survivor also gave a, um, he also gave a written statement uh, of testimony to a conference at USHMM a few years ago. And in that he omits the point at which he escapes. Uh, he says that he stayed with this boy forever, which is true, they did stay forever, but with the exception of one small part at the beginning. And, and so the reason why I use this example here to answer your question is a way of showing that these bonds are important uh, because he, he certainly spoke about that needs to, to continue that bond afterwards, but they're not everything. Um, and there are these points where people sometimes um, will shed those bonds in order to try and better themselves through, through escaping. Um, so it's important not to, I think, not to overestimate um, how important these things are at the same time as recognizing that they did genuinely lead to uh, a lot of help. Um, and perhaps the fact that when he was much later on in life asked then to write down his experiences of this, the fact that he omitted that point of, um, of, of escaping perhaps suggests that that's something that he regrets. Um, I don't know, and it's hard to be able to in, infer into his, um, his true meaning from a textual perspective. It would be more interesting if 
he were to have given a, a, an audio or a visual um, description of that, because then we could see the, the ways that he speaks, um, but, but we can't. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Just that, okay. <laughs> Thank you again for your lecture. It was really amazing. Um, my question, so when you're talking about Alan in, in the ghetto and the, the youth and how he still felt at age six in his youth, um, I was wondering, as you've been looking through the ages of the HA, have you noticed that there is a gender difference in the way in which you see themselves as coming at age or see themselves as still being able to um, be a youth? Like, do you see a difference between girls and boys as they talk about their experiences? Definitely. There's, there's definitely a very significant difference between the way um, female Jewish youth and male Jewish youth um, responded to persecution and approached to these things. Um, at the same time, that's not overbearing, that's not all the, always the case. Um, there are many very good examples of a, a Jewish youth um, resistance movement uh, that organized something called the Teal, um, Hebrew for excursion, um, which smuggled um, Jewish youth group members, Zionist youth group members, from Hungary across the border into Romania and then onwards to, um, to, to Palestine. And a lot of the members there were women, uh, were, were girls. <laughs> the, the, the division is difficult to appoint um, precisely because of what we're talking about here. Um, so women did play a, a large role in that as well. So we can't fully say that, that there were gendered roles. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at ghettos, um, it's, I, I haven't come across a point at which uh, a Jewish girl was doing something like Alan was. Um, a lot of the time, the, I suppose because the family unit is so under attack, um, these, these family units try to recreate and, and bolster the traditional norms. And so the, the, if there's a young girl, she's often with the mother um, within, within the house as the boy will start to take on that outside of the house. Uh, role. So there, yes, there are, there are certainly these gender differences, um, but they're not always the, the case. Yeah? Um, first, I want to say I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. It was, it was really good. And as well, I also have a final question. Brilliant. <laughs> but um, I think my first question is regarding their religious identity. So you mentioned that Alan joined a Zionist group and that he was very involved, but at the same time, he was also in a Roman Catholic school. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that relationship. Mm -hmm. And also in your presentation, you touched base a little bit on the pauses of what he was talking and your use of, and how you interpreted those um, testimonies that he used. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you wanted to interpret the, those silences and pauses that you encountered but also if you also um, focus on how they um, how they express themselves, the uh, movements that they did, if they laughed or yeah. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Um, two very good questions. Uh, so on, on the first, in terms of their religious identity um, and how we approach this clash effectively between going to a Catholic school and, um, and joining a Zionist movement, agency is very important. When we're thinking about this because Alan didn't choose the school he went to, his parents did, uh, whereas Alan did choose to join a Zionist movement. And so when we look at Jews in schooling, what we're really seeing is we're seeing what their parents perceived uh, and what their parents wanted out of them. And for the majority of, of, of Jewish parents um, at this time, they are incredibly entrenched in an assimilationist ideology that has been the case for, for decades. And so sending Alan to a Catholic school, they almost don't think twice about it because it's potentially the best school in the local area. It's the one closest to the home. It's the cheapest, all sorts of reasons. Um, and the, the challenge is what, uh, what, what Alan is experiencing. Uh, but that's not something that his parents are experiencing. And so when he chooses to then join those Zionist movements, that's when we were actually seeing his agency and his perception on these things. But at the same time, it's important to note that 
when Alan is talking about Zionism and when he's talking about wanting to go to Palestine and dreaming of a future Jewish homeland in Israel, he's not completely rejecting Hungary. Um, he's still speaking Hungarian most of the time, 99% of the time. Um, there are some amazing Jewish school books from, uh, from Devletsen where you can compare the, the books in sort of biology that are beautifully neat. And then suddenly it gets to the Hebrew book and you can see that the, the, the child's really not interested. Um, and there are scribbles everywhere. It's the most uh, sort of horribly looked after book in, in the world. And so going to a Jewish school isn't necessarily an, an indicator that you know, you're, you're massively sort of keen on your Jewish identity. Um, schooling is, is not necessarily a perfect indicator of that. Um, but equally, for that individual, um, he was very good at writing Hebrew, and he wrote letters to a friend of his, uh, a family member, I think uh, an uncle, uh, who was in Palestine at the time. He wrote these in Hebrew. So he's able to, he's just not necessarily that interested in the subject at school. So we've, we've got to take these things with a, a pinch of salt. Um, yeah, so I think in, in terms of answering that question, it's very much boils down to those themes of agency of who's making the decision um, and as well of, of not necessarily taking up face value membership of, of a group. The second question was on silences uh, and how we interpret these silences as well as on the movement that we see in the VHA. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the most useful parts of the Visual History Archive. Um, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to come here for this fellowship is to be able to actually watch these people giving their testimonies. Interpreting silence is always going to be difficult. There are some points where it's easier than others. Um, when he's slowing down around deeply emotional parts, uh, I think we can very easily read in some trauma uh, into that memory. But it's also interesting to note that they're often around times that he's talking about relations with other people, um, be that with a family member or a friend. Um, they're not just at points of sort of, of, of traumatic events, uh, they're also around people. And that's, I think on, on one hand, shows the importance of these relations um, to the way that people responded to persecution, to the way that they sought to continue having these, um, these, these bonds and these support networks. And the second thing on movements, movement is incredibly useful. Um, sadly, I don't think I found any examples in Alan's testimony, but in others, um, particularly of people who were deported to Auschwitz, um, we have people often pointing uh, very quickly when they're talking about selections and people going left, right. And I find that's a very useful indicator to see how they perceived the speed and the rapidity um, of selections in Auschwitz. It comes across much better when you've got someone physically showing the, you know, the almost thoughtless left, right um, of the selection ramp than when someone's just telling you or when you're reading an account of it. Um, there are other examples of, of gestures that people have used. Um, I can't quite think of many at the moment, but there, there are lots. Um, and they're, they're really interesting because I think they show us a lot about how people remember that experience, um, but also about the way that they felt it and, and they experienced it. Um, and they're so much easier to, they make it so much easier to understand that. So times when as well, people make noises maybe that aren't, you know, that, that probably the people who have to transcribe these testimonies sort of have nightmares of, of trying to, to write down. Um, but things that, because we're able to have those through, through the VHA, we're able to, to see and understand uh, the feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mark. So I have some questions from um, the virtual audience. Uh, nice. um, two from, from Jacqueline Adams. Um, one, Jacqueline says, thank you for your talk. Um, thank you. Did Alan consider fleeing Hungary? If not, why not? And the second is just Jacqueline is also like, very interested in the conversation that's been happening about um, how like girls, like female teens, boys, male teens, experience persecution differently. Mm -hmm. And like, wanted to know if there's anything more um, uh, on that topic. Yeah. 
Um, um, excellent. So, Alan, during the war, um, never tried to flee Hungary. Um, that was only after the war when he realized that there was nothing left for him there that he chose to leave. This is an incredibly interesting topic, and it's something that varies so much based on individual people's experiences and their position. So I've been, I've been listening, for example, to some testimonies where people are taken into these forced labor battalions, and some of them will try and escape immediately. Very few, but some. A much more common pattern of escape is that these people will stay in the battalion as they are moved around Hungary. But the minute that they hear that they're going to be sent out of the country, they try to escape. Um, and this is whether or not they're being taken to the front uh, along with Hungarian soldiers to fight uh, on the Eastern Front in the Soviet Union or into concentration camps uh, as, as a lot of them were towards the end of the war. And I think there's something very important there about that timing. The fact that it's only when they're going to be taken out of the country that they perceive a need to escape. There's a difference, there's a, a threshold of what they deem to be acceptable for them to suffer and what they won't. Um, and this is very difficult to, to try and pin down uh, and it's different for everyone. And some people never try to escape. Some people start right at the beginning. Another form of escape, which people consider both during the Holocaust and importantly, actually in those immediate post-war years is going to then Palestine, the, the British mandate of Palestine and now Israel. A lot of the Zionists desperately are interested in going there, but not all of them actually do. Um, and this is for a, a variety of reasons. A lot of the time it's family related. Uh, people will choose to remain in Hungary because their parents don't want to. And there's a, a really interesting testimony that I listened to where a father talks to his son about the potential of his son going to Palestine. He says, well, you can go if you want, but I'm not staying. Your mother is buried here. My parents are buried here. I grew up here, I'll die here. There's this perception, and, and this, this, so this again shows us the generational difference between an older generation that is very invested in the country and a young one that is less so, but will still be won round by that family argument and that, that individual chose to remain with their father instead of leaving. And so when we, when we think about escaping Hungary, um, these things are, are very specific to the circumstance that people are in. They're very different based on each person. Uh, hundreds of people chose to leave their families uh, and to leave. Um, and they, they, they also, importantly, I think, it's a, a history of escape that transcends both the wartime and the post-war period as well. And obviously, to a certain extent, the pre-war as well. The fact that Alan's uh, father's brother moved to Miami in 1920 is, is also significant. The second question on um, the differences, the gender differences between teenage experiments. Yeah. Um, I think that Alan just wanted if there yeah. were other ways that uh, like girls and boys experienced persecution differently. Um, Definitely, yes. Um, this is a horrible part of the Holocaust in Hungary um, to, to talk about and to get across uh, because gender and sexualized differences between men and women were exploited by more often than not the Hungarian gendarmerie um, who led a lot of, well, who, who took part in a lot of the, the persecution of the Jews, um, even when the German army had invaded. Um, I believe the numbers I'd have to check, but I believe Eichmann turned up to in Hungary with about 50 or so um, men, and they deported 40,000 Hungarian Jews. Uh, you can't deport 40,000 Jews with 50 men without mass collusion and support of the locals, which they had. And Hungarian gendarmes would often require um, Jewish boys to drop their trousers uh, in order to find out if they were Jewish or not. So if someone was pretending to not be Jewish, 
um, they would get them to drop their trousers and they would see if they're circumcised or not. And if they're circumcised, they must be Jewish. Uh, and so they would be persecuted. At the same time, when we have ghettoization, Hungarian Jewish women are often subject to brutal, invasive um, medical, medical examinations um, to see if they had hidden anything within them. Um, and of course, these, these are, you know, this, this is an example of two very different gendered experiences of, of how someone has, how people suffered from persecution. There are other ways as well, which I've spoken about already in terms of um, how, how she's reacted um, and how families reacted differently, but then those are, those, those are some other examples. And I think that's an important way as well of remembering how gender and age act as categories across society, not just within certain places. Um, so they're, they're relevant categories, both for persecution and for responses. Martha. So um, I have two questions. First of all, thank you for this talk and um, happy birthday to Andor or Alan, whose birthday was on the 20th. Yes, indeed. Um, I have you. two questions. Yes. One is about age perception. Mm. Um, so when you talk about that topic, of course, my mind automatically goes to people who are deceiving um, to pretend to be older. But I just wonder whether in your research you've encountered age deception pretending to be of adults pretending to be younger, mm. because that also would be quite illuminated about youth as how it's perceived and um, expressed. Yeah. And the other is about, you talked about these um, masculinities, these masculine communities in the forced labor battalion. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how those or that notion of masculinity intersects with youth, because I thought it was very powerful when you were talking about the presence of, of his father is a signifier of his youth. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether these masculine communities or masculinities that are being um, Kind of formed and expressed in these battalions is a mover in the other direction, away from them. So just curious. Thank you. Very, very good and probing questions. Um, so the first one on age deceptions, there were people who lied about their age to present themselves as being viewed as younger. Um, but this was often adults who were maybe 40 or 50. Um, when they arrived in Auschwitz would say that they were younger in order to then be viewed as being fit for work um, rather than being too old and being with the, you know, the very old and the very young. I haven't found any, I don't think, or many at least examples of people around the age of, of early twenties pretending to be teenagers. There may well have been some, um, and I think I may have actually seen one in the archive yesterday. So I, that, that's definitely something that I'm looking at. But most of the time when people lie about their age, it is either the young trying to be old or the very old trying to be a, a little bit younger. One survivor that I was listening to yesterday actually spoke about how when they arrived at Auschwitz, she had learned German at school so she could speak with the people that were interrogating them, whereas her mother couldn't. Um, her mother was 50 years old and the German officer asked how old the mother was and she responded saying 50 and she realizes now and she says as well later in the camp that that response sealed her mother's fate and had she said that her mother was 40 her mother would have come with her so she knows that that age gap was important. Um, and that's a signifier that there were other people as well. And um, what we know from, from the research I've done that there were other people as well who did lower their ages, um, but that it was perhaps less common um, and also perhaps less easy to um, sort of present. Um, particularly if, if you're male and you've been through the labor battalions, you, you look physically drained and different. Um, but if you're, if you're female, you haven't been through that, there's, there's obviously a difference. 
Um, on that note, I'll mention actually that it was to a certain extent easier for young Jews to present themselves as being older in the concentration camp system when they were deported because all the fit young men had already been taken into forced labor. So the, um, the, the demography of these transports to Auschwitz was predominantly the elderly, the very young and the women. And so on the selection ramp, it's potentially easier to present yourself as fit when compared to a very elderly or a very young person. Whereas if those men had been there, it would have looked very, very different. Um, so there's, there's very much a connection between those two histories. Um, and that could have then also led to people who are older and who in other transports might not have been chosen to, to work, being able to get through looking as if they were younger. On the second question, in terms of this intersection between masculinity and youth within the labor battalions, this is a, a key part of my research and something that is my ideas on it are constantly developing and they're, they're constantly growing. It's it's fascinating to see these instances where boys and their fathers are together. But it's also important to remember that whilst that's a reminder of their youth for them, from the outside, they're just two men. So from the perspective of the perpetrators and also potentially from the perspective of the other, um, the, the other survivors who are well, the other people that are working there um in the forced labor battalions they are they are two men they don't necessarily perceive them as a father and son and so when we're talking about masculinity in the labor battalions we're constantly fighting against how they were perceived and what they really were and how they perceived by themselves and how they perceived by others it's not really much of an answer to your question i'm afraid um but it's, it's something that, that makes it more complicated to, to think about. We've got one at the back first. Yeah. I, I missed a little bit of part of your lecture, but I enjoyed it, like the lectures that you are teaching today. You. Um, can you tell me just a little bit about like just like, who is Alan and do you have like a website where to catch up on the history that you were talking about? So, um, so Alan was, he, he's the one in the middle, uh, on the top left. Um, he was a Jewish boy born in Hungary and, um, he was, um, so he was, so he was born in Hungary in a town called, a city called Mishkolz, um, uh, which is in Eastern Hungary. And he went to, uh, first a Catholic school where he received some anti-Semitic abuse from his teachers and from students. Uh, he then went to a Jewish school in another city called Debrecen for one year, uh, where although he didn't receive any anti-Semitic abuse, most of the content and the structure of the teaching was the same. Uh, and then he returned to that other um, city, Mishkoltz, um, where he, he and his family were then taken into a ghetto. His father was taken into forced labor when he was younger, just before he started school. Um, and that forced labor battalion would go around the, the country doing the, the army's dirty work, so to speak. Um, I think that roughly brings us up to when you arrived. Um, he, he was then able to um, meet up with his father when he was forced out of the ghetto and into a forced labor battalion. Uh, he was, that, that happened because a Hungarian army commissioning officer taught him how to lie about his age. Um, but even though he lied about his age, uh, he was still younger than he should have been to be conscripted. So there's a there's an interesting clash between the law and the implementation there when we're thinking about youth. Uh, and yes, I believe this lecture is being recorded, so you'll be able to um, watch it back on the Center for Advanced Genocide Research's um, um, YouTube channel, I think. Um, and also, if you um, look me up on the University of Oxford system, there are um, there's more details about my research and things there. Well, uh, some of the questions uh, 
One thing is uh, maybe it's really worth mentioning, uh, which came through your talk and also your elaboration during the discussion, is that one very unique uh, feature of the persecution and the Holocaust in Hungary is that uh, women were not uh, recruited for first labor mm -hmm. in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Can we say this kind of really as a general kind of statement? Because that would uh, kind of distinguish uh, it from all other kind of annex territories, occupied areas of Europe. They yeah. are usually females, they are also mm -hmm. uh, granted for first labor. That's why. Second, uh, when you mentioned that uh, some of them try to escape when the transports were uh, kind of scheduled to the country, mm -hmm. is this because of their national kind of sense, or is it because they had knowledge what might mm -hmm. be uh, uh, kind of layout in the future when they would be transferred to sub camps of uh, concentration camps in Austria, for example, or directly to Auschwitz? And uh, the larger question I actually have is. Um, when you talk about this kind of teenager who starts taking on a different role, this reminds me of this very influential book from uh, Mary Kaplan, uh, uh, The Dignity and Despair, where she uh, really infused, uh, 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 intervened with the uh, idea that women took on a new role because mm -hmm. of persecution after 1933 in Nazi Germany. While she based her work mostly on testimonies written by women, I wonder, do we need to complement maybe her assessment uh, that also young male and female uh, teenagers actually had to uh, take it on different roles? And don't we only kind of realize this now because of the testimonies we can have of these two teenagers? Mm -hmm. Which, for example, Mary Kaplan could do because the written testimony of well, these middle aged women. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Um, so I'll take those in turn. So the first one on women and forced labor, 95%, um, yes, it was only men who were taken into the forced labor battalions in, um, in Hungary. Interestingly, the law that stick, so the, the parliamentary passed law that stipulated the creation of these forced labor battalions, um, whilst it has a very specific provision for establishing them, it also has a broader provision that said that Boys of 14 and older and girls of 16 and older, I believe, those are the ages, but I'd have to check, um, but effectively younger boys and girls um, can be called to serve the country in a way. It's very vague in terms of the, the wording in Hungarian is, is very vague on purpose um, in terms of how they can do it. And so there are, individual examples where girls were used in labor. These are often ad hoc places. Um, so one girl was um, was used, I think, in Mishkots as well, actually, somewhere. Um, one girl whose who, testimony I was listening to was used as a laborer in a forest, um, gathering branches, uh, cutting down trees, things like that. Um, but she was, she, she sort of came into that because she was in that area. Um, another couple of examples from the VHA are of women who on purpose went to find work. Um, one girl went with her mother and joined a sewing, a, a sort of a forced labor sewing factory uh, in Budapest because they believed that provided they were helping the war efforts, they would be protected. So there are instances of women in forced labor, but they're not part of the broad sort of policy uh, of forced labor that was was going on that was a specifically male gendered feature obviously when they get into the concentration camp system that's completely gone um, and the the examples that i showed of the prisoner registration documents are actually from a group of mostly if not all hungarian jewish women uh, and that's a group of a thousand of them who were chosen specifically because they were women uh, to be taken out of Auschwitz into a camp called Allendorf in Germany, where they worked uh, as munitions. And of course, there's a long history of women being used as, as munitions workers. So the second question was on why 
there's a higher chance of people trying to escape when they leave Hungary uh, or when their battalion is, is set to leave Hungary um, than when they're still in Hungary. Interestingly, people don't talk about, they, they don't give a reason when they're talking about their escape. Um, so anything that I say is, is purely interpretation uh, and taking from their, um, sort of from the context of, of their remarks. I think a lot of it is, so I think a part of it is that sense of being Hungarian. It's not so that, that doesn't necessarily mean wanting to serve Hungary, but what that would mean is that in a way I'm okay if I'm still in this country because this is my country um, and I'm in a familiar place. Whereas if I'm taken out of that, uh, I'm no longer in familiar area. So it's, it's viewed differently uh, as a different level of, of acceptability. Um, in terms of how much they knew and how much that could have influenced their dis decisions, this is one of the fiercest historiographical debates in the Holocaust in Hungary. Um, the Verba Wrestler report came through um, Hungary. So some of the Zionist youth movements who handled the transport of that report, that being a report from escapees of Auschwitz that detailed what was happening there in, in intricate detail, that was passed through Budapest, both out to Turkey and to Switzerland. And we've got some of the Zionists who gave testimony who talk about handling that report. They talk about knowing about it. So some people knew directly from that. But in terms of the wider population, probably less so. I think the consensus historians are starting to come on the, the sort of the very hotly debated topic is that, that some people knew, but the vast majority didn't. And also, even if members of the majority had heard very few, one maybe didn't believe it, but also a large proportion of them believed that provided Admiral Horty was still in control, that they would be safe. Um, and we've actually got testimonies that say almost verbatim that provided Horty is here, we're safe because Horty is a friend of the Jews. Um, and they, they perceive that because he did he, he constantly refused German attempts to deport Jews from Hungary. Um, now that's not at all because he was a friend of the Jews, um, but there, there, there was that perception as well. So I think that could have an impact there too. And then, could you repeat your final question, please? The last question was about uh, changing our new roles. And I, uh, yes. Came up or came to me because you mentioned that uh, Alan took on this new role, uh, partly because of the absence of his father. Yeah. Brian Kaplan talks about this in Nazi Germany, that because men were persecuted, and then women took on certain roles that mm -hmm. were more in public than they were used to. So now this is an interesting, uh, different aspect where a male teenager mm -hmm. absorbs this role of the kind of father of the family. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Yep. The Kaplan quote. Um, very much so, yes. I think this is something that I'm wanting to, with my research, sort of contribute to a, a further discussion on, because we definitely see a lot of young Jewish men, Jewish boys, taking on these, these new roles. The, the fact that you know, Alan did that to try and get his family moved from, moved into the hospital to try and protect them is a, is a significant sort of act of of family care. Um, at the same time, we can complicate this even more by instances where the father figure within the family was too old to be conscripted to forced labour, and so the son was. And if the son was was you know, maybe of a, of a of a middle age, not necessarily a youthful age of, of under 21, but 21, 22, the fact that they are conscripted out, um, I think can contribute to this discussion as well because they are then taken out in place of wearing lots of other Hungarian families, Jewish families, the father is. So in a way that child is being like the father in another family. So young people, broadly defined, 
uh, young men, sorry, broadly defined, taking on the roles that their fathers would traditionally do is a key theme that that runs through the Holocaust in Hungary and is, is something that definitely we need to we need to be talking about and we need to be including. Um, and that goes for, for young women as well, um, although with young women it's a lot more difficult to access because there aren't these things like the forced labor battalion that are um, that are there. Interestingly, as I mentioned, with the the invasive searches, invasive searches were often only done to adult women. They weren't done to young girls. Um, thank God. And so there's a, there's a, a, an age element there as well that I think we need to look at in terms of, in a way, the perception of the perpetrators that these young girls are too young to be a be a threat in terms of hiding things um whereas their older parent or older parents or older siblings even sometimes are um, so there's ways that there's ways that perpetrators view youth as being a, an important factor but then there's also ways that that Jews in their responses viewed it and yes taking on new roles is something that's both genders experienced and it's something that we need to talk about. At the same time, I'm very wary of, of telling the, you know, often commonly said narrative of young people come of age, they take on adult roles, etc. We We know this from a lot of history, uh, a lot of history writing over the past few years. And so I want to try and maintain that youth element and show how young people are experiencing these new adult roles, but they're still experiencing them as young people. Um, and I think that's where so something where this can really complement Kaplan's um, suggestion uh, and really, really go in with her research on looking about how men, how women took on those new roles. They didn't become men by doing so. And just as the women didn't become men, young people don't become adults just by taking on their roles. Um, one last question. Yeah, one last question. Okay. So um, this is one last question from um, Lisa. I heard about people who moved from Hungary to Argentina placed their children in Catholic schools as a way to assimilate them as quickly as possible and in a way to hide them from persecution. Do you see evidence Hungarians did similar school transfers to keep their children quote unquote safer than sending them to a traditional Jewish school as tensions were rising before the war? I realize personal school choices may never be known unless we're reading a diary from some other direct sources. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. There is a survivor that I met a couple of years ago in Oxford and spoke to, and she grew up in Hungary and she went to a Protestant Christian school. And when I spoke to her, I was struck by the way that she described this because she describes that everyone in this school was Jewish. But she said, but we were all Protestant. But of course, none of us were Protestant because we were all Jewish, but none of us were Jewish. <laughs> and I think this really sort of highlights this, you know, this case and, and what, what that question was, was asking about. Because yes, you know, people do put their, their children into these schools in a way to assimilate them. The parents want them to grow up assimilated just like them. It's also a way of protecting them because they're then in a space that is not signified as being Jewish. At the same time, if you're in a place where you're minority Jewish, you then become a target for persecution as Alan did. But as, as you did, the survivor that I spoke about just now, um, as she found, it was almost a safe space because everyone there was, was Christian but not. Now, interestingly, she then grew up and now in Oxford does regularly attend a Christian church. Um, and so has, has in a way you know, changed her, her own identity throughout that time. It was, it was very interesting to hear the, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the person who asked the question. Carissa, yeah. And to hear them asking about, um, but recognizing that you cannot always you cannot always work out these personal choices because these are personal choices and these are personal choices made by the parents um, for their children. They make them for a variety of reasons. Some of them may be to hide people. 
I haven't come across a sort of a concerted effort to, to hide children in that way. I think a lot of it is often them trying to maintain this family sense of Hungarian assimilation, um, or as I said earlier, of, of various other reasons that quite frankly are, are, are irrelevant to the Holocaust. Um, yes. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barnabas Berlin, for this really insightful lecture. And I thank uh, everybody for coming here in the room, but also our virtual audience and also for the uh, participation in the discussion. And also, uh, at the end, I wanted to thank uh, the donors of this fellowship, which always brings uh, amazing uh, new young scholars uh, with their research to our campus. Thank you. Okay, that was all. Thank you.